uh, filmmaker Eugene Jarecki with us uh, and his film The House I Live In, which is one of those documentaries that, uh, you know, it, 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 this is Sundance's forte where you tell a really good story and you enlighten people as to what the truth is and, and what's going on and, of course, you know, the excellent filmmaking. Welcome, Eugene. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. The House I Live In uh, kind of touches upon something that's in the periphery of everybody's mindset in the country. It's, sure. the, you know, the war on drugs, what are we doing about it, the after effects, everything like that. But you take a really kind of a deep dive into the lives of specific people when it comes to this so-called war on drugs. I do. And it all started because of um, a very close friend of mine, somebody I grew up with, a woman who had cared for me and my brothers and my family growing up, African-American woman named Nanny Jetter, who's extremely close to me mm -hmm. to this day. She's retired now. Um, but I had grown up um, really learning a great deal of, uh, about her life. Um, and I saw that her children, who I was friends with, they were my playmates when I was a kid, that as we got older, you know, I ended up with the life of a comfortable, privileged white American with a lot of choices, and I got to be a filmmaker, and I get to express myself, and, you know, I feel like I have real possibilities. And I saw that um, her family, the young people in her family that I'd cared about so much and known so much as I was growing up, and we remain close today, their lives didn't go like that at all. And I tried to understand what were the obstacles, particularly for black America, but as I learned more broadly, for poor Americans in general. And, and when I asked Nanny Jetter, she thought it was drugs. Not the drug war, just drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered, well, what had drugs done to black America that to a lesser degree than they had done to white America. Why had they been so focused on black America? And that's where I started a journey then that really unpacked for me a much larger issue having to do with the war on drugs so and it, its impact on black Americans and now poor Americans. So this is a film that actually probably took decades for you to start to formulate in and my think heart, about. And, yeah, and, 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 definitely. And, and in myself, it's taken decades. The work of the film, a handful of years. The, 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 the feelings that go into it honestly go back to my parents' time in Nazi Germany and my mother's family's time in Tsarist Russia, where mm -hmm. I had, you know, I've been a child of flight since I was a kid because my parents and my grandparents and others fled persecution. They fled oppression. Mm -hmm. And we have a form of oppression going on in this country in the name of a, a war against illegal narcotics, but it's really become a war on people. And the clearer that became to me, the more of a mission this became uh, for me to help other people understand what I was coming to learn about something really quite shocking. So how do you begin to tell that story? I mean, you know, a lot of the story deals with, you know, the prison population, yeah. who's in jail, who's not, the reasons they are, yeah. you know, the, the unfathomable uh, sentences that some of these, you know, people are, are serving for yeah. relatively minor things as opposed to what's... How do you, how do you begin telling that story? The first thing you have to do is try to get your head around the, the totality of the issue, on the one hand, which has to do with the forces, political forces, economic forces, corrupt forces that have undermined our law, undermined public policy, so that, as you say, you know, I have a character in the film who's in jail right now in Oklahoma for life without parole for three ounces of methamphetamine. He's a 47-year-old white American who found himself, uh, you know, in the skids, struggling for work, uh, got a little bit hooked on a substance, then started selling a little bit to get by, got a first offense selling, a tiny little amount, then got another second offense, because the first time he went to jail, they didn't give him any treatment. He came out, he was still mm -hmm. addicted, so the cycle continues. The third time, three strikes, he's in jail for life without parole. And when the average American sees a person who is being punished for nonviolent activity mm -hmm. for a far longer term than the guy in the next cell from him who's in for murder and will get out in about 14 years. What We've lost priorities. We've lost any semblance of common sense in what the priorities are of sensing. So that's the kind of thing I had to start to learn, well, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. What are the political forces that shaped that? Uh, how did Reagan contribute? How did Nixon contribute? How did Clinton contribute to ratcheting up and escalating this war on drugs to such a point that it's lost all reason? But then again, you're also dealing with human stories. So there's this balancing act between Kevin's personal story, that one gentleman, right. and there are many like him in the film that we deal with a lot of lives in the film, cops, judges, lawyers, um, uh, medical professionals, jailers, wardens. We deal with a lot of people all in and around the war on drugs, and I try to capture their lives mm -hmm. and do that in as human a way as I can so that the audience can feel about them what I've come to feel by thinking they're just amazing people sort of caught in a grip. They're all caught in a certain way in this under one roof. That's a little bit where the house I live in comes from. We're all in this thing until we change it in some way. Well, let's, let's take a look. I know we have a, a clip mm -hmm. from uh, the house I live in, and yeah, uh, it's a, revolving around right around what you're talking about. It here. is. Yeah. It's a clip set in Lexington Penitentiary in Oklahoma, um, which is actually the penitentiary where we filmed in several prisons. This is the one where Kevin Ott, the lifer, uh, lives. But what you'll see now are we're getting to know sort of the warden and several of the jailers and other inmates uh, around him in that facility. Okay. The house I live in. 
the interesting thing about that clip, I think, is, uh, you know, the, the, they made the one mention, and we, we kind of touched on it before we showed it, uh, you know, when 50 people come in, yeah. 50 people have to leave. Now, yeah. you know, you got 50 people with, you know, first time user offense or something like that. What kind of people are leaving the prison system to make room for these so-called offenders? Sure. Well, what's happening all the time, and this is one of the things I noticed throughout the system, when something stops making sense, mm -hmm. um, you see examples of nonsense wherever you go. So they will, for example, have 50 coming in because there's an overcrowding problem. Right. They'll be releasing 50. And so there's almost no rhyme or reason. It's almost like a hotel that's mm -hmm. dealing with it. Yeah, room, there's a room available. Room yeah. rates, you know. And at the same time, you know, we went to a prison nearby here, uh, another part of Oklahoma, a tougher prison called Granite, where we also filmed. And at Granite, I got there on a day where they were in full lockdown. Full lockdown had happened because there was an altercation, a disciplinary in incident uh, involving a violent offender. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when they go into lockdown is that everybody gets put into lockdown, the nonviolent along with the violent. In the what same in the same area. world, in the same okay. areas, locked down all together. And that's where people who advocate for prisoners will say, you know, the prisoner who is a nonviolent offender, a young person who did a stupid thing, sold some drugs, took some drugs, got caught, whatever it is, they're now in there and they're in full lockdown with inveterate criminals, mm -hmm. with hardcore people who rape, rob, murder. And one of the things that happens is when they're treated the same as those people, well, the line for them blurs. Mm -hmm. Now they start learning the tricks of the trade from those well, people. Well, it's their community now. It becomes, I mean, these are the people they're going to live many, many years with. And they're much closer to them than they are to the right. people who are locking them in with them. Mm -hmm. And so you start to lose a sense of precision about what you're doing. And it, therefore, should not surprise anyone that you have these incredible rates of recidivism when people come out who have been put in for drugs. There's no treatment when they get inside. The, drug, the, the prisons are not there to help people get out of the cycle of despair that they're in. And if anything, all it does is teach them how to be better better at it. So they get out and get more quickly to drugs, get mm -hmm. more quickly back into dealing, get more quickly into escalated levels of, of crime. And so we see that's just one small part. We traveled to about 25 states all across what is now really a prison industrial system that we have in place. And we talked to people who run companies that service prisons. I went to a prison industrial trade show in Florida. A trade show. A trade show. They might as well have been selling like plumbing hardware, right. but they're selling you like restraint chairs and gags and special kinds of cuffs and then there are phone companies there selling phone services to the prisons that gouge the inmates where, yeah, you get your one call. Mm -hmm. It's like five bucks a minute that your family has to pay, so they want to rush you off the phone. Right. Um, another guy was selling Qurans. He said, look, there used to be Torahs and Bibles in prisons. Things are changing. We need Qurans in the prisons. I mean, you, Starting you, into a service industry. And, and, tra and it's, it would be funny if it wasn't so tragic. Right. All these people, and they're good people, and they're hardworking people, and they think, I'm trying to help the world be a better place, and honey, I came home from work today, and I make a better restraint chair that's more humane. The woman who's selling me the chair keeps telling me the chair is more humane, and she wants to think that, and it probably is more humane than the other restraint chair. But, lady, it's a restraint chair. Mm -hmm. And, like, this was the country that Madison and Jefferson founded with an eye toward human dignity, and we're slipping down a terribly tragic slope toward being what we now are, which is the world's largest jailer. We incarcerate more people in absolute terms than any other country on Earth. That's including all totalitarian countries. And we incarcerate more of our population by percentage by far than any other country. About 1% of the country is in jail. That blows away every other Western democracy that doesn't even compete. It blows away totalitarian countries. Yeah, and I think it's something that a lot of people, you know, in the general public, you know, they don't realize the deep dive of what this, you know, mm -hmm. what these issues are. You, you screened the film. We did, uh, You've yeah, had some absolutely. interesting reactions. Uh, yeah, it's been wonderful reactions. Sundance audiences are a dream. Mm -hmm. And you get, to, uh, you get to get a combination of, you know, the everyday person on the street who's come to the festival and is thrilled to see certain kinds of films and you get a really good um, and, and very fresh reaction from them. And then, of course, you also get a sort of insider reaction of how people think it's going to play when it comes out nationally and things mm -hmm. like that. We did. I mean, Sundance does something really smart with these Salt Lake screenings, too. I went to Salt Lake last night and I saw this, you know, very, very much sort of pretty regular urban audience yeah, coming different, out of Salt different Lake crowd, and different crowd terrific things. reaction. And so all of it has been very, very fulfilling. Well, so Sundance was basically built on the documentary. I mean, you know, the, the film so. festival really started and the documentary was still shine. Uh, it's this kind of documentary that really makes sense. Of I've it, had the good fortune like to have a few of my documentaries right. here, and it makes a huge difference to the, it's the best way that you sort of start the process of reaching out to the country with your film. And it's obviously something I care pretty deeply about, and I want people to care deeply about. We need to change what is happening to poor people in
in this country under a system of laws that are draconian, unfair, and frankly inhuman. They're, they're immoral. And I think it can change, and Sundance is a great way to sort of send a message that people are thinking and people are caring about something which we then need to sort of take outward in, more, in a more concerted way. The, the, the film is The House I Live In. Uh, Eugene Jarecki, well done. And uh, I know you're going to be here all week. You've got more Q&As. We'll yes. We're going to be screening the heck Thursday out Thursday at the so. library and then Saturday at the Egyptian. Those all are right. the two. Get more screenings. And of course, you know, you can go to the film guide. You can go to the website to get more information on the film itself. We'll be back with more in the can after this.